Welcome to the Prepper Almanac. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are going to discuss Prepping 101, how preppers get ready for a disaster in just 7 days. The whole idea of preparedness is to plan ahead. Anyone confronted by a natural or man-made disaster has two options, bug out or stay home and bug in. There's no in-between. FEMA recommends putting together a 72-hour bug out bag. That's the average duration for an evacuation from a disaster. But most people don't evacuate. What's a prepper to do? The easy answer for most of us is to do both. Be prepared for a 72-hour bug out and be just as prepared for a two-week bug in. However, the preparations and what you assemble for either scenario are very different. When you choose to stay home and bug in, you're on your own to a large degree. Support may be available, eventually, but more often than not you'll be in a highly self-reliant environment so the amount and range of preparations are going to be a bit more complicated. To keep this simple and to keep this clear, we're going to make 7 fundamental preparations over a week dedicating some time each day to a specific survival subject. During the video, we'll discuss things you might want to learn, think about, buy, build or collect. We'll also have links in the description below for items we recommend. Day 1, Water. In most locations water can be easily found whether it's rain, snow or a local creek or pond. The quality of the water will vary requiring varying degrees of treatment, filtering and purification but the best way to survive a water shortage is to have some water in storage. Storing two weeks of water is not unreasonable but the amount may surprise you. Estimating water needs. According to the Mayo Clinic, the average adult male requires 15.5 cups, just short of a gallon, of water a day. Adult women require 11.5 cups, about 3 quarts, of water a day. Cooking. It may seem that cooking would use up a lot of water but there are simple ways to avoid that. For one, cook with methods that don't require water. If you are cooking with water, make sure it's part of the dish like a soup or stew. Cleaning. Now's not the time to scrub the floors and steam clean the carpet. There's also the need to do dishes, by hand obviously, laundry, also by hand, and general cleanup of all the things around us that shouldn't remain dirty. Doing these things by hand actually conserves water. Natural water sources. If your water usage exceeds your storage or the duration of a disaster exceeds your expectations you'll need to consider alternative water sources. Rain, snow, and ice. Perhaps the easiest source of raw, wild water. It's even delivered. Local lakes, rivers, creeks, and ponds. The quality of the water in lakes and rivers varies widely depending on their location and the potential for things to run off and into them. Existing well pipes, stand pipes. Most modern wells are drilled with equipment and a long length of pipe around 6 to 8 inches in diameter runs from the surface to the bottom of the well. If the power is out or the pump quits, you can still harvest water from the well pipe. Emergency filtration and purification. Bowling water for 3 minutes is the time-tested way to purify water but it takes time. Water filter pitchers. Water filters built into 1 and 2 gallon pitchers have become very popular over the last few years. Even water that has been treated, filtered and purified is subject to contamination over a long duration. The basics of boiling for purification. The simplest and most direct approach to water purification for immediate use is boiling. The minimum time for disinfecting water through boiling is 3 minutes. Boil the water for 3 full minutes before adding any other ingredients for cooking. Day 2, Food and Cooking. Many of us have fairly well-stocked pantries and could at least go a week with the food on hand. One challenge would come from any power outage compromising a refrigerator slash freezer. In that event, eat the refrigerated foods as soon as possible with the knowledge that most refrigerated foods are only safe to eat without refrigeration for 4 to 24 hours. Frozen foods are reportedly good for up to 48 hours. Storing a two-week food supply is not hard. The only challenges with storing food for a two-week duration is making sure they don't require refrigeration or freezing, and keeping an eye on some level of balanced nutrition. Cooking without power. For many of us, cooking without power is nothing new. Charcoal and gas grills are the usual choice for emergency cooking. The benefit of a charcoal grill is that any wood can be used for cooking. Small stoves powered by propane or white gas slash regular gas could also work but any cooking over a fire or gas flame other than natural gas should be done outdoors. Day 3, Electricity and Light. Many of us have gone hours and even a day or two without power. One of the things most of us immediately start to think about as the day grows late is finding a flashlight or candles to get through the night. If a power outage stretches into days and weeks things start to get a little more desperate and more robust options are worth considering. 
there are a variety of ways to produce electricity and any of them can power various things you need while the power is out. Generators. The fastest way to generate electricity is with a generator. The size of generators is measured in watts and kilowatts and the size you need is proportional to your usage. If you want to power some lights, electronics, refrigerator slash freezer and other standard appliances you could get by with a 4000 watt generator. Solar power. Solar panels are an excellent source for emergency power. The amount of power generated is proportional to the number of solar panels and the capacity of the batteries. Think about small solar power banks that can hold a charge to recharge small electronics like cell phones, computers and other devices. Solar may be an overreaction to a two-week prep but they will always be available for any emergencies down the road. Let there be light. The most immediate need tends to be light and it's not always about flashlights and batteries. Candles have proven themselves over centuries and small candle lanterns are a good choice to contain any open flame. Kerosene lamps and lanterns powered by white or regular gas or propane also provide steady light but should only be used outdoors unless there is significant ventilation. Day 4, Heating and Cooling Heating is often the most critical need. There are passive solutions for cooling from finding shade to staying hydrated but when wind chills dip below freezing the threat without heat is immediate. A wood-burning fireplace is an easy solution for some but you may need to close off some rooms given the overall inefficiency of a fireplace for heat generation. There are propane gas solutions that can work and some homes with large propane tanks use it as their everyday heat source. Smaller propane heaters are also a possibility but are better suited to smaller spaces, may need to be vented and may require additional tanks in storage. Staying cool. Climate change has changed the landscape as it relates to heat and even parts of the world traditionally cool have seen their share of heat waves. Heat has always been a threat and hundreds have died during heat waves. Start with hydration. Drink lots of your stored water on a regular basis. Go low. Basements are always cooler and if your home has a basement consider spending more time down there. Attics are heat traps and vents in the roof can help move trapped air up and out. Embrace the fan. Fans need electricity, but not much. If you do have a source of power, properly placed fans can improve air circulation and make a heat wave bearable. Remember your vehicle. Most cars, trucks and SUVs have air conditioning. It means using up some precious gas but if you have gas stockpiled or the gas stations are open the air conditioning in your car can provide welcome emergency relief to anyone overcome by the heat. Day 5, First Aid Hospitals and medical professionals are often overwhelmed during and after disasters. Emergency services are stretched thin and even pharmacies might be closed. First aid is another priority and it's not about a kitchen first aid kit. First aid needs Cuts and scrapes are common and typically require cleansing of the cut or scrape, a topical antiseptic and various types of bandages, gauze or medical tape to cover the cuts. Deep wounds require more than a simple bandage. Butterfly bandages and sutures are often used to close wounds. Deep wounds also require deep cleansing usually with sterile saline and are sometimes dressed with a topical antiseptic. Burns range from first degree to third degree are treated with specialized burn care products including burn gels, burn wraps, saline solutions for cooling and cleansing, and various antiseptic creams and moisturizers. Heart attack and stroke is well beyond the ability of most people in the category of first aid. There are some basic steps and treatments that you should learn including how to recognize the symptoms. Your best hope in the event of a life-threatening medical emergency is the ability to get the person to a hospital or medical professional or at least be able to contact emergency services. First Aid Kits The easiest way to prepare for a first aid emergency is to buy an expedition-level first aid kit. They include equipment and supplies for a broad range of medical emergencies and are similar to the kits carried by paramedics. Medical Knowledge It would be wise to have books on hand that detail how to handle and treat medical emergencies. The worst time to learn something for the first time is while it's happening. That's especially true for a medical emergency. Learn how to close a wound with sutures and buy a practice kit and practice first. Medical equipment. These are basic things like crutches, canes, splints and braces for wrists, elbow, knees and ankles, and other items that support or protect an injury. Over-the-counter medications OTC. Take the time to check the medicine cabinet and at least make sure you consider the following OTCs. Pain relief, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, aspirin. Congestion relief, Actifide, Sudafed, NyQuil, Daquil, others. Antibiotic ointment, Neosporin. Skin conditions, hydrocortisone, calamine lotion, anti-itch cream, Bactin, others. 
generics are okay as long as they have the same percentage of active ingredients listed on branded products. Prescription medications. Stockpiling prescription meds gets a little complicated. Sometimes it's an insurance issue and other times it's a medical or doctor issue. Day 6, Defense and Communication. Any disaster or emergency with a two-week duration is less likely to result in severe security concerns as opposed to a long-term disaster where local services and authority sees a continual breakdown. However, even the shortest duration could present threats especially in urban locations. Just as important as communication. Communication is all about awareness, awareness of what's going on around you and awareness of how family and friends are doing. Non-lethal weapons checklist. Pepper spray, tasers even a stout cane can give you a way to defend yourself without lethal force. If used indiscriminately they could aggravate a situation to greater violence. Firearms checklist. A general recommendation is a rifle and handgun. A lot depends on your location, the situation and your willingness to use lethal force. Take the time to get training in the use of any firearm and how and when to use them. Communication. There are two levels of communication worth thinking about during and after a disaster. One is the simple ability to watch or listen to local news to stay aware of how things are unfolding in your area. The other is the ability to stay in touch with family and friends to both reassure them of your situation and to have the reassurance that they're okay. Day 7, Sanitation. Disasters are a mess and without power or running water everything gets messier. Sanitation covers all things related to a toilet, bathing, personal hygiene, general cleaning and domestic tasks from washing dishes to doing the laundry. Following a disaster things get dirty and the need to clean up may be more frequent. As we wrap up today's video, if you have any questions or if there are any topics that you would like discussed in the future, let us know in the comment section below. And be sure to subscribe to the channel to learn more about prepping and share the video with others that may have a passion for prepping or are curious about prepping in general. And lastly we have put some links to some prepper supplies that you might want to check out in the description below. Thanks for watching the Prepper Almanac.